Well, hello there and welcome from my side. My name is Bryn and it's a great privilege to be able to look at God's Word with you today. Before we get into it, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look at this passage of Scripture, that you would speak powerfully to us, convince us of the truth of what you have to say, and stir our hearts as we contemplate it. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you're anything like me, you love a good story. Stories can spark our imagination and they can transport us to magical worlds. Stories are able to stick with us in a way that mere facts just can't, at least not with my brain. And stories are such a big part of what it means to be human that when we think about our own lives, we can't help but think about it them, our life as a story that we're a part of. In the first part of Ephesians 2, the bit we're looking at today, Paul reminds the Ephesian Christians of their own story. It's a true story, and it's one that is true for every Christian. It's what they've gone through. So he tells us the story in three stages. The first thing we notice is that these Ephesian Christians start off in a pretty horrible situation. Paul tells us that at the start of the story, they are living in death. Let's look at the way he describes it in verse 1. He says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Paul says to the Ephesians, they started out dead. That's not to say that they weren't moving and breathing. They were dead in their transgressions and sins. So their lives were caught up in the things of death. The wages of sin is death. The end result of sin is death. Sin leads to death because it leads to separation from God who created us and who is the source of all life. So what are the symptoms of being dead in your transgressions and sins that Paul's talking about here? Well, he tells us death is characterized by following the ways of the world. Not only that, but the ways of the world are actually the ways of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That is to say the devil the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, to many of you, that might sound a bit extreme. You might wonder, how can Paul say people naturally follow the devil? That isn't a conscious thing, and it's not something that, it's not like most people think, you know what, I'm going to follow the devil and do whatever he tells me. That sounds like a good idea. It's not that at all. Paul, what this widespread case of death death in transgressions and sins that everyone is under, that Paul's talking about. So what does this way of following the way of the world or the ruler of the kingdom of the air look like? Well, Paul tells us in verse 3, and he includes himself among those who at one time did these things. He says, living in death looks like gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. It's a picture of selfish life in which our actions and our thoughts are at the mercy of our flesh. It's a, in this picture, our desires and our thoughts that come from our flesh are intensified to the point of dominating us and ruling us and making me, us do whatever we feel. So we don't just eat when we need to. We overindulge. We don't just sleep or rest when we need it. We're lazy. We don't just earn what we need to survive. We're greedy and enough is never enough. We don't keep sex for the way God has designed it. We pervert it and misuse it. That works itself, this principle works itself out in different ways for each of us. But the root problem is the same, the problem of the flesh gone wild. The thing is, behind the scenes there is a corrupting force that means our flesh, um, which is the thing that controls our natural desires, isn't a neutral thing. Our desires and thoughts are influenced by something sinister that doesn't have our best interests at heart. Ultimately, it's leading us away from God, and so away from the source of life and of everything that is good. For that reason, Paul describes that condition as dead in transgressions and sins. It's a helpless situation. For the most part, people don't, we don't even acknowledge we're in it as people. 
It's like a group of people enjoying time at the beach. They're splashing around in the waves, making their way along, and they're blissfully unaware that they're headed towards a rip current that will take them out into sea, away from land and away from safety. So that's the situation at the start of the Ephesian story. It's a bleak one. They, like the rest of humanity, were living in such a way that death was inevitable. They were as good as dead. Thankfully, that is not the end of the story. Paul then moves into stage two. It was called, but God made you alive. So, so far in the story, it's just been people living the way people do, following the ways of the world and being led by the cravings of their flesh, not recognizing that behind it all, there's a sinister force that is leading them straight to their death. Right here, when things are as bad as can be, Paul reminds the Ephesians of the news that changes everything. Let's pick it up in verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The good news here rests in the fact that there is a good God. Despite the fact that the Ephesians, along with the rest of us, were by nature deserving of wrath, God, who is by nature merciful, loved them. And because of his great love for them, he took them from death to life in Jesus. And he did this while the Ephesians were still dead in their transgressions. They didn't make a move towards God. God loved them while they were still his enemies. God showed them mercy, which simply means he didn't punish them the way they deserve to be punished and the way that he had every right to punish them. Now, if you want to imagine mercy and understand it, you can imagine a situation where you decide to steal someone's bicycle. But imagine they catch you and there's no chance for you to get away. That person now has every right to have you arrested. But if they decided to let you go, to not let you be arrested, to forgive you, that would be an act of mercy. But the thing is, Paul says there's even more to the story than that. God didn't just show mercy by not punishing the guilty. He says God is way more generous than that. And it's almost like he's so excited that he blurts out where the rest of the story is going at this point. He says, it is by grace you have been saved. God didn't just show mercy, but also grace. Now, to understand the difference between mercy and grace, we can go back to our imaginary situation in which you stole the bicycle and you were caught by the owner. Now, if mercy looks like the owner forgiving you and not punishing you the way you deserve, Grace is even more than that. Grace would be the owner letting you not only escape punishment, but then giving you the keys to his car and saying, here you go, it's yours. Grace is freely giving something to someone without them having earned it. It is giving something to someone who doesn't deserve it. And so, in his grace, God doesn't simply let the Ephesians off the hook for the punishment they deserve. He actually gives them something awesome in its place. Have a look at verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. God saved the Ephesians from death and raised them up with Jesus to sit with him in the heavenly realms. And this links back to Paul's prayer back in chapter 1, if you remember that from last week. Remember how he spoke about God's incomparably great power for those who believe, which is the same as the mighty strength God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. There's that language again. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked. And he put all things under Jesus' feet. God's grace to the Ephesians meant raising them up with Christ to sit with him in a position of rule over the universe. It's an extravagant gift to people who deserved his wrath, people like us. And yet, this is what God offers. But notice it's only available through Christ and in Christ. It's a gift 
worthy only of the obedient son. It's given only to Jesus. It is his birthright. He's the only one who's earned it. But in God's grace, he offers it to anyone who is united to Christ. Now, we'll get into how that happens soon. But for now, notice the purpose of this extravagant gift. In verse 7, Paul says, God seated us with Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God's actions serve the purpose of displaying the absolute extravagance and overflow of his grace. When God saves sinners and treats them like this, it is God's goodness and perfection on exhibition to be marveled at for all of eternity. The same way that at a Leonardo da Vinci exhibition, you might marvel at his brushwork and his skills at recreating the human form on canvas, at the new creation and forever going on forward from that, we will marvel at the unmatched and unimaginably great grace of God to treat his enemies with the kindness that he shows to his beloved son. But at least some of that lies in the future. It's a certain reality, but Paul is aware that for the moment there is a life to live here in this world characterized by people living in death because of sin. And so he reminds the Ephesians of the third stage of their story. He reminds them they are alive for a purpose. Now in this section Paul gets into the nuts and bolts of how it is that they were saved, and then he tells the Ephesian Christians of God's purpose in giving them life, giving life to those who were once dead. So first he talks about how they were saved. And it's very important that this comes first because God's purpose in saving them flows out of the way in which he saved them. Let's pick it up in verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Paul is saying, Ephesians, God saved you from the punishment you deserve and gave you all of these awesome privileges, not because of anything you've done to earn it, but because of his grace. He makes the point emphatically, it is not because of anything you've done. It didn't come from you in any way. There is absolutely no reason to boast about being saved or your greatness because you were saved. All that you have and all that you are is freely given to you by the God of grace. This is important because the second we forget this truth, things go bad. We start running into some problems. We become entitled and arrogant, thinking God somehow owes us something. Now, whether we're aware of it or not, we sometimes blackmail God, thinking things like, I obeyed you, and so you owe me that thing that I want. Paul says, no, 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 you're mistaken. God doesn't owe you a thing. You were dead, remember? The only reason you're alive is because God was merciful and didn't punish you the way that you deserved. And what's more, you have so much more than you deserve, so much over and above just forgiveness, because God has been immeasurably gracious towards you. There is no room for arrogance in this story. Salvation is a gift from God. Jesus is the only one who has earned God's favor and blessing. And so we should be blown away that he is willing to share it and to share it with the likes of us. So that's how people are saved and made alive where once they were dead. And it's important to get that clear. Now that that's clear, Paul is ready to move into what the Ephesians were saved for. And he says it in verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now the idea of God's handiwork is something like saying we are God's work of art. You might picture one of those artworks where the artist has taken bits of garbage and trash and sculpted it into something better than the sum of its parts. But what God has done is even more impressive than that. Because we are created in Christ Jesus, the finished artwork reflects Jesus' beauty and his perfection. Paul is saying to the Ephesian Christians, once you were dead, but now in Christ, you are not only alive, but you are God's masterpiece. 
And God's masterpiece isn't made to just sit somewhere in the corner and to look pretty. This is a work of art that is made to be put to work. God has made his people alive in order to do good works, which he prepared for them ahead of time. Now we'll see plenty of examples of those good works in the second half of uh, the book of Ephesians, but perhaps it'll be good to just look at one of them. So have a look at chapter 4, verse 28. Paul says, Anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Now, to go back to the example, the, the hypothetical situation where you stole the bicycle, and not only were you spared from punishment, but the owner gave you his car. The good works here that flow out of those who are saved would be like the owner of the car who gives ownership to you saying, don't just use it for yourself, but also to help others who need it. God's masterpiece is the very opposite of what people were like back at that first stage of the story, remember? And we see this is reflected in the language Paul uses to describe both the old humans and the new ones. So about the old humans, he says they were dead in transgressions and sins, which contrasts the new humans who are created to be alive in Christ and to do good works. Now, it's lost a little bit in uh, some English translations, but it's there in the Greek, this difference and the link between these two. So you see the living dead from the start of the story walked in trespasses and sins. But people who are made alive in Jesus walk in the good works God has prepared in advance for them to do. That is the purpose of the part of the story that the Ephesian Christians were in when Paul wrote to them, and the part of the story that you're in today if you're a Christian. You have been saved for good works. You have been saved through Jesus from death to a new life as God's work of art. But before you experience the fullness of what it means to live with Jesus and to rule with him, we have to live in such a way that it makes clear that God has done something amazing in us and to us. Something has happened to us that has changed us to the very core. We saw in chapter 1 that the power which raised Christ from the dead is at work in those who are saved. And its job is to remind them of the hope which they have. And that will empower them to do the good works God has prepared for them to do, rather than continuing in sin and being ruled by the cravings of the flesh. Good works naturally overflow from people who have been transformed by God's grace and who have been treated infinitely better than they deserve. Is that your experience? If not, it might be worth considering whether or not this transformation that happens when people are taken from death to life has actually happened to you. Or maybe what you need is to be reminded of the story and that you're a part of it. That is, after all, Paul's p purpose in telling the Ephesian Christians their story. So for those of us in stage three of the story, awaiting eternal life with Christ, we need regular reminders of the danger of sin and the life that we once lived the living dead. We also need regular reminders of God's grace. Because of that, we are able to do the good works God prepared in advance for us to do. I hope you've seen something of that today as we've looked at this passage. Now, while this is the story, while Paul is telling the story of Christians in this passage, there's a chance that you're listening today and you realize that you are part of the first part of that story. You're still living in death. You're living a life that is characterized by following the cravings of your flesh. And you realize that those are leading you further and further away from God and to death. If that's your life story and if that's where you find yourself, there's only one way out. And that is to come to God and to ask him for mercy. Beg him to be gracious and to treat you better than you deserve. And I can promise you, you will find that he treats you not only better than you deserve, but far better than you can possibly even imagine. Let me pray as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace to us in Jesus. Help us not to take it for granted. 
Help us to walk in the good works you have prepared for us. And I pray that we may grasp this truth and live as people who have been transformed by grace, taken from death to life. Pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. A song playlist is going to come up after I disappear from the screen. Why don't you click on that and we can sing together.